one of the few times that we have is to be able to hear from someone who knows absolutely everything that they, about the condition they're going to talk about. Uh, we will, of course, discover ourselves at ease and that will do and clearly knows more than all the rest of us put together. Uh, and we have challenged him to not only discover the Roy disease, thyself disease, but also in his tenure here with us to get us to the point of curative therapy. He's not going to talk about the latter part of that today because we're not quite there, but Jules, thank you for telling us the eucalyptus story. Thank you for letting me do that. I'm known for probably only God, but uh, sometimes I hate the subject, sometimes I enjoy it immensely. I'm going to have the second slide already. I think it's going to occur. The story starts uh, when I came from Belgium to this country as a and a little bit trained pediatrician and MD from Ghent in Belgium and um, I ended up in Children's Hospital in Boston at Harvard Teaching Hospital where I had two years and my tutor there was Alan Cropper who passed away in 2011 at the age of 85. He told me I know nothing about the mucopolysaccharidosis and you with your project you're going to tell me the story of it. He knew absolutely everything of the <laughs> <laughs> So he, he was checking on me. Anyway, he said that next month, every month you have one hour with our teacher, our tutor. And he said, the next month I give you another topic. I have never, never changed that, that topic. I come to, after two years, I, had, uh, I really was interested in having a formal training in genetics, and I went to the the law of story, I'm not I'm going to skip obviously, and uh, uh, with John Opitz and David Schmidt in Madison, Wisconsin, for a training and for a PhD in genetics. And uh, they knew that I knew about, and I had actually quite a few skin biopsies with me, because I was going to solve the enzyme defect in at least one of the mucopolysaccharidosis. And John Opitz uh, said, well, you should be involved in the metabolic clinics we have here. I did, and not, not a few months after I got to Madison, Wisconsin, I met this uh, the mother and this little girl, who was by my dear friend John Opitz considered a congenital malformation syndrome, mental retardation. That was that was the, the label. Now. To me, they didn't, they didn't look anywhere near that. And the mother, a nurse, was very interested to know more about the disease. And lo and behold, I could not classify that girl clinically in what I knew about the mucopolysaccharidosis. First of all, at age four and a half, she was smaller than any of these MPS patients I had seen in the past. She had not a large head, what you always expect in any mucopolysaccharidosis, and uh, had features that I hadn't, I didn't know what it was. So I was very interested, however also disappointed, uh, when I checked the urine, because we were in the primitive 60s, uh, there, were, there was borderline mucopolysaccharidosis, and obviously we didn't have anything to measure the oligosaccharides. We did, we certainly did. Um, the, uh, next slide, please. Well, here she is, and let me define eye cell disease. I will tell you right away what eye cell disease really means. We, this is a, a slowly progressive disorder apparent from birth, and I'm going to concentrate a little bit on the features at birth of such babies because most of them do not get diagnosed in nose at birth. They have a severe growth failure and skeletal dysplasia of a pretty severe order as well. 
craniofacial coarsening is progressive, as you already see here, because this lady had also some, some uh, pictures with her of how the kid looked uh, two years earlier, I remember. There is an enormous physical handicap. The classic eye cell disease patient never brings it to walking unaided. They eventually uh, move around the room in a walker, but uh, very few, if any, really make it to independent walking. They have frequent upper respiratory infections, and they also <coughs> they have very delayed neuromotor-wise, and their, uh, their way of speaking is also limited to, uh, first of all, they have a very hoarse voice, they have very impressive um, um, uh, hypertrophy of the gums. Some of the patients I have later seen with Alan Crocker in Boston had even gums that they could prevent from closing their mouth. And usually these kids die in early childhood. Some of them even during the first year of life. Next slide. Uh, let me concentrate on the challenges we have with uh, diagnosing the gut disorder at birth. Next. This is, they are all, very few exceptions, have a low birth weight when they are born up term. In those days, there was nothing wrong with the pregnancy because I'm talking about the days before we even had ultrasonographic study during pregnancy. They have a flat, swollen type of face. They have wax type, Madame Tussauds type uh, skin, uh, you know, all over their body in some patients more pronounced than that's a French patient I saw a couple of years later um, uh, as a neonate. Um, inguinal hernia in the males nearly constantly. They have already, they are hypotonic, these kids, and yet they, when you try to move their shoulders, the shoulders are already stiff. And that in a, that's a very important sign that very few people really look at in a newborn. Uh, they can have, and that has been published in several other publications, uh, because you see here that crooked TV, uh, lower leg there, and uh, you see that not infrequently in ML neonates. Uh, it can be club foot, it can be a hip dislocation. Most of these hips are already not totally well in place. Bowing of long bones and sometimes already kyphosis or thoracic de de deformities. Next slide. Uh, here I really uh, do again the same thing. They have a puffy face, a prominent mouth. If you look at these kids in, uh, in profile, they have a mouth that is a little bit about like a fish, and that is due to the swelling of the, the gums, especially. Um, they're, uh, and they obviously have already special skeletal dysplasia. I'm going to say a little during this talk about the classic uh, dysostosis multiplex, Jürgen Sprenger, who gave the name mucolipidosis 2 to eye cell disease, has made up the uh, uh, concept of dysostosis multiplex, which is common to most, uh, to most uh, lysosomal storage disorders and is very pro pronounced, very pronounced in the patient with eye cell disease. What I will do before and after, because it was actually David Silens who said these kids have three uh, skeletal dysplasias. One precedes dysostosis multiplex, and the last one is a, a very severe osteoporosis after you have diagnosed and continue to see slightly slowly evolving with dysostosis multiplex. I will have a chance to talk about before and later. Next slide. These are some other neonates. This is a repetition of the patient I just showed. Uh, that patient there in the corner is right now approaching his ninth birthday. He will be nine years old. <coughs> and old. He has two brilliant parents parents who are very willing to cooperate for further study. Um, he has a brother and a sister who are normal, preceding him in age. He is the youngest kid, yet pretty smart for an ML2 child. Again, indication that we are talking about a connective tissue disease in principle, 
much less about a neurological, a neuron damaging disorder. Here are several other French, and even this patient here, the, the AB neonate it wasn't easy to make that diagnosis when you, certainly not on a picture, but uh, when you hear the story, you know, you look in these kids for a big liver and they don't have a big liver. They are in, uh, in, in beta, the beta galactosidase mutation, GM1 gangliosidosis has a much bigger liver. The ML patients are so called, they are not really storage disorders. You will see that even with primitive pathology pictures in a little while. Again, the diagnosis is difficult, yet after two months, the same patient, that face doesn't really look normal. You agree, I hope. You know. And here too, Abbert, you know, in, in the hands of his father, I do think he is a pretty typical example on how the severely affected uh, eye cell disease patient can be seen. It's a small child, it's a child with in trouble. Some vital signs are temporarily also rather weak. And a few patients not recognized are eventually already <coughs> passing away in the first weeks of life, if not the first day. Um, next slide. The differential diagnosis in infancy is also challenged by other conditions. Uh, for instance, GM1 gangliosidosis and gal infantile galactosidosis. We have seen these two patients in Ghent. And that is an eye cell disease patient, the one I just showed you. That's a French patient. Um, if you look at the liver of these, deep, these three patients, you have the biggest liver in GM1, the less in, in, uh, swollen liver in the uh, galactosidosis, and least liver and in, in, um, an increase in eye cell disease. And uh, that is, uh, sorry, again, the skeletal dysplasia when you x-ray these three children, it's not easy that, to uh, make the diagnosis on x-ray. This is another severe child. This child is 11 months old. That's published by Dr. Stevenson that's the, in the infantile free cell acid storage disease disorder, which at birth is another, uh, uh, and especially because you <coughs> here, later on you have a liver increase, but not at birth in these patients. Next. Uh, again, there are more than these differential diagnoses. Salidosis is barely represented in the in infantile moments. Uh, they are here in the salic acid storage disorder. Also, some uh, carbohydrate deficient glycoprotein disorders should be thought of, and a few peroxisomal disorders as well. In uh, non immune hydrops, is rare. It, I have I know only of two published cases, whereas this is much more frequent in some other lysosomal storage diseases. And you have to think of lysosomal diseases first before you talk about lysosomal disease when you have it in non-immune microbes in the neonate. Next. Well, the differential diagnosis is obviously helped by the biochemistry lab and by the radiographic studies. And I'm talking Tim about the old days, you know. Next slide. <coughs> well, here are again, if you compare permanent disorder, eye cell disease, infantile salidosis, infantile galactosalidosis, GM1 and ISDD, just shown a while ago, you can differentiate by you know, the gingival hypertrophy is by far the most severe in eye cell disease. Uh, it, the alertness is much is better than in GM1 gangliosidosis. The, the, there are these, uh, this table is useful in the clinical ass assaying of the symptoms you, you collect from a neonate where you think eye cell disease is among the differential diagnoses. Next, now, uh, you obviously request in uh, some acid hydrolases, uh, hydrolases, and here are the, ex the, the enzymes that I have found most useful in finding enormous amounts or increased amounts in the plasma. Uh, in the days, the early days, we usually did the skin biopsy, and these same enzymes are in the, in the, the culture from the skin biopsy um, very much reduced. I'll come to that in a moment later. Do never 
use local sites to make the diagnosis enzyme-wise in uh, for for um, for uh, mucoviridosis to or cell disease. You need the leukocytes to rule out other storage diseases because these enzymes are ob obviously absent oh. in uh, uh, absent in, in uh, leukocytes, but the leukocytes are normal enzyme-wise as far as uh, the eye cell disease or even mucoviridosis is concerned. Uh, next. <coughs> This is a patient who, whom I saw from the Netherlands very recently. This child was already severely sick when I saw it in Ghent. And uh, you have here again the same symptoms of the, the early childhood case, a hoarse voice. This young lady could barely say a few words that I, the parents understood it, I didn't really. Again, her liver was barely uh, uh, enlarged. She had an umbilical hernia, all of them have it, and the, the boys usually have already had operations for their inguinal hernia. Uh, she is obviously never uh, going to, as a matter of fact, this, lady, this young lady died a pulmonary death already before she was uh, two years and ten months of age in 2016. Um, she has, if you would be able to, I will come later on to this hand, she already had at this age broad uh, fingers and hands. Fingers that are burnt, they are normal. Next slide. Here is uh, just an illustration of a rare case that was walking independently and when I look at the mutations now, I do think that she could even be an outlier from the definitions Dr. Cathy and myself have made. Again, that the disorder in the lower survivals is progressive is illustrated here rather well. Next. The face of the, inf the, the infant of the young child with eye cell disease is also interesting. Uh, this picture of the first patient is overexposed. But what I want you to show is, first of all, you see the gums in both of them. They are swollen, not extremely so, but clearly they have very, they, they, these kids have the impression of having two shallow orbits and the eyes are therefore rather prominent. There is a, a venous pattern visible uh, subcutaneously around the orbits. The uh, gingival invertebrate I already mentioned, and if you would see them in profile, they have a prominent mouth as well. The, the impression of uh, cranial synostosis, I come to that more than once still, um, is only an impression, there is no real, real uh, 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 the, the cheeks are usually a little, a little reddish, and there is a teleangitatic capillaries you see often. Even the patient here, uh, the photo is hyperexposed, you have had it as well. I think I have more patients. Next slide, please. Yeah, here are some of the, of the patients studied here. Some of those are uh, seen by Dr. Uh, Cathy. And uh, this is Ashton Kelly. And the reason we started our ML interest here in this situation was in 2005, 2006. And this patient was, uh, I believe, operated in the city of Atlanta for cranosynostosis and another child we had seen before also. And these kids had almost been close to death after the operation for cranosynostosis. These were the years that the mutations were, that the gene was found, that the, the gene, uh, the mutant gene screening started, and Dr. Mike Fries and Dr. Sarah Katty and myself got pretty <coughs> mad and others around the, 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 the group as well, Dr. Spreller, who was not present at that time, found that was uh, approaching these kids almost uh, by, almost comparable with murder. Anyway, we started, we have to look into that, and that has resulted in several studies, which I will report gradually as we go along. Uh, but you see very much the same, the same, again, impression of too short, uh, too, sh so the, too short and, uh, uh, and too small orbits. 
And what I do think is that there is already a change in the cartilage bones before ossification starts. And that is why the shape of the face is already different. We know that the, 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 the top of the skull is composed of intramembranous bone ossification. And we will see very soon that there is plenty of reason for having these sutures closing a little earlier than normal. Next slide. Here again, the face. This is Luca Amel. He lives near Cherbourg, where the American and the English landed in, 2000 and in, in, in 1944. He, he, lived, he comes from that city. He is a, a sturdy boy and he looks like a better. I know his mutation, but he is an ML2 case for sure. This is a boy, a Dutch boy, who was uh, a candidate for cranial synostosis operation. He has not been operated and he, he lived to be seven or eight years of age. This is a, a French uh, patient also. Uh, you see his uh, reddish cheeks, that's an, an interesting common feature they have. Next. I, the, the three, I'm going to repeat this, but this is what we call the so-called pre, pre, uh, uh, periosteal cloaking, where you see that double outline alongside the diaphyses of the long bones. And you see that only in the patient lower than, uh, younger than a year of age. Uh, I come to that later on in this talk. Next. This is also the, the immense broadening of the the, the, the metacarpals. They are obviously short, and they have very tiny ends. And these very tiny ends, including the, the, the <coughs> epiphyses, you can see them as little tiny balls. They are nearly the epiphyses what did exist at birth. And, uh, because in those children, the uh, endochondral ossification ends uh, clearly uh, uh, at birth when the children lose the influence, obviously, of the maternal organism. When I t this is an extreme example of how the pelvis looks like, like the very narrowing here of a bone that circular, and this location of the hips, that the epiphyses are still visible, but most of the time they disappear. Jürgen Spranger mentioned in his uh, Dysostosis Multiplexi that the pubic bone and the, is the ischial bone and the pubic bone are also longer and larger than uh, in relation to what the iliac <coughs> bone is. And you see that in uh, early on pretty, pretty pronounced and it is helpful for making a diagnosis. Next. Well, <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about the research in the mid-60s. We have, next slide, that is an ugly cell. And you can call this an ugly cell, or you can call this a beautiful cell, I don't know, what you, but it is full of granules and very, very different from the other storage disorders like Hurler and Hunter cells are a little bit, cyto, have a little bit cytoplasmic granularity, but nowhere near. The nucleus is very, this cell is alive, we see it here in the face contrast microscope. And, uh, it, you know, the, some of the, that picture you see all over the place because I have been asked here, if I would have given, uh, asked for $50 per picture, I would have probably been missed because so many people asked me for my cell. But this one is a very beautiful one. And I come to that again in a moment. Next slide. Uh, here are, is the first enzyme study, large study, and it filled up two or three incubators in the Marshall lab where I was working. These are six strains, two, 163 and 216, are two ISL patients I saw in Wisconsin, uh, these two. And the other, the, the, these two here, yeah. The others are the four parents, the two couples parents of these two patients. And number 48, I think, is a hurdle of a hunter. I forgot that this time. When you see grow, you, you make cultures in small dishes, you put the same amount of cells and you let them grow. In the beginning, nothing much protein is found. 
and you see here the protein level as it increases. And you see the only substrate we had available in those days was phenolphthalein glucuronate. And that had the advantage of when you see and when you uh, alkalinize the patient after incubation, it turns red. And if it doesn't turn red, you know, we already see the result. That was spectacular. Again, that was the reason that some people thought that beta glucuronidase was the enzyme defect in ML2. However, because of time sir. But I was immediately disappointed to why. And I would like to ask you why I was disappointed. First of all, if this is so good, these two patients after very, when the cells were very, very dense, there was much protein and they still had almost no enzyme glucuronidase activity. Um, the parents should have been intermediate. You know, in this test they should have been intermediate and they went beautifully with the controls as well. I have many other experiments I see, see if time for that, but we have proved that better glucuronidase was in hampered in its activity, but we didn't know why. Next. The, we also did electronic micro, uh, electron microscopy work and the ILD, it, uh, maybe these are, you know, uh, are we certain that these, these granules are real? But in the EM you saw this plenty of uh, heterogeneously filled with stuff. It's interesting that the pathology features you will see in a moment. Next slide. <coughs> This is, well, this is still culture work. I was in initially for a few days very unhappy that I could not show metachromasia, what is easily demonstrable in, uh, in the mucopolysaccharide stories. So if you see the, the red cytoplasm, you know, and the, the blue cell, because, the, because of the, the binding of, phenol, of uh, toluene blue, and the stored mucopolysaccharide. Here I could not do that. And then I said, well, that it must be another disease because I can never show this. other tests where this is a lipid staining material, that is an alkaline phosphatate staining, and it really, it really tells us something about the wall of the lysosomal storage because clearly these granules are small lysosomes. We have shown that electron microscopically, and probably why are there that many? I do think that in the fibroblast there is a potential uh, extra uh, extra synthesis of lysosomal walls and making sure that they try to catch up whatever material they're going to do. In pathology cases, even in the gums of these patients and in the skin, the living skin, you see only empty vacuoles. And I think these tissues are helped by clearing out their stuff by the surrounding cells that are not affected by the normal 6 phosphate problem to get the, the, the enzymes to the lysosomes. Next slide. <clears throat> well, we found that uh, metabolically, we found that this is part of my thesis, that the GAGs were, and the lipids and the oligosaccharides for the first time were poorly, were very poorly uh, leaving the cell in, you know, a bit when we used, for instance, for the GAGs, the SO4-35 marker. The lysosomal hydrolases were markedly efficient, not only beta glucuronidase but this is work I did with David Wenger in, uh, in, in O'Brien's lab in the early, late 60s, early 70s. Next, and yeah, the cells were very poor in recovering from the freezer. Interesting, if you want to keep an eye cell disease alive, you better go to ML3. I come to that in a moment because these, patient, these cells recover from the freezer well, but the ML2 cells have a terrible time recovering from the freezer. They sit there and they do not divide anymore and they, they grow fat, but you can't really do anything with it. You know. Next, <coughs> well, here are some enzymes and comparison, this was all, all done at the very same time, lots of, of controls, and you see that beta the alpha, but excuse me, beta glucosidase and acid phosphatase are normal, but all the other enzymes in the cells are very, very efficient, less than 5% of normal in most instances. Uh, so 
it meant that there was some general thing wrong with these enzymes because uh, we couldn't possibly think of one mutation that otherwise would uh, affect so many enzymes. Now, the two enzymes that were normal are actually known right now to be membrane bound and not dependent on the monosyxphosphate marker, which we didn't understand nor know at those days. Next slide. <coughs> well, the, in the condition culture medium, we had an increased activity, uh, and I must admit that was first discovered by uh, the, the, the Swiss P by Swiss group. But we did the same thing in Madison already, and we found the same thing. And these enzymes leaked out of the cells, apparently. They were unable to cure other cells with um, monogenic uh, abnormalities. They didn't need to enter the cells yet. Other normal uh, enzymes, uh, en uh, cells, uh, uh, enzymes from, from, taken from normal medium uh, and from cells entered the eye cells very well. So there was something wrong with the <coughs> enzymes produced by the eye cell mutation. Next slide. In body fluids, we, uh, it was soon discovered that this increase of enzymes was also very, very important, not only in the plasma, but also in the urine. And obviously we had uh, uh, very much uh, oligosaccharides in those days. We couldn't really differentiate the oligosaccharides from some other disorders, especially the galactosidiosis and things like that. Next. I will skip this uh, slide because we did the pathology together with Dr. Martin in Ghent, Belgium, in the Antwerp, Belgium. We did uh, two autopsies on, um, on, ML, uh, on ML2 patients. Next slide. And you see here, obviously, an enormously disturbed endochondral ossification. You see here the mostly empty vacuoles in phagocytes <coughs> and mesenchymal cells of the central nervous system. But the pathologist was very, and he was a successor to Dr. Van Bogart, the famous neuropathologist. You know, he looked, at, even Van Bogart has looked at some of these cells. He died many years ago. But he said the neurons to me look pretty okay compared to what the, the, the neurons in, in, uh, in herbal disease are destroyed, are, are completely, uh, you know, damaged. And that is not the case. So here we are dealing with a disorder that affects all those mesenchymal cells that surround and help the neurons in the, in the brain, but not the neurons themselves. That makes it interesting. This is the kidney where you have the Bowman's capsule. This is also a, a, you know, a, a group of cells that are mesenchymal. You see here these swollen lysosomes. All of these cells are only showing empty vacuoles. Next. Uh, in the, in the uh, autopsy cases, we found that in liver, kidney, spleen, and brain, that only beta galactosidase was uh, a little bit low, and I think salidase may have been low too, but we didn't have any substrate for that, you know. And all the other acid hydrolases were even normal or even higher than normal. That is another thing that, uh, you know, was discrepant with, uh, with what we found in fibroblast. It looks like when we isolate fibroblast by skin biopsy, we isolate that mesenchymal cell from all other helpers around or different cell type. But again, it's not that's only a medium done hypothesis. Next. Well, Dr. Neufeld has come in here. Her uh, very <coughs> large contribution, she writes a, 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 a survey article in the, bio, the annual review of biochemistry. And she mentioned there uh, the work by me and by others, all the early guys. And now my, my name has disappeared completely. It's only no fault you mention. You know? <laughs> that, is, that is what 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 reviews do to you. Anyway, the, they, it was already she found out in her lab <coughs> the very important fact that there was a missing marker, and that this marker was a carbohydrate and was residing in the carbohydrate part of these enzymes that are all glycoproteins. That was a very important step forward. Next slide. 
Uh, it soon was by the co-workers of hers and the other guys, especially in Germany, the recognition marker for the enzymes to, to get to the lysosomes was identified as being mono-6-phosphate. Um, and I cells do lack this marker. Next slide. And the, the, the enzyme defect was found simultaneously in, in 1981 by Kurt von Figura, a very smart uh, uh, biochemist, a good friend of mine. He was an MD, but he was, uh, you know, he's, he left uh, medicine and became a fantastic biochemist. And uh, Stuart Kornfeld, the teacher of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Richard Steed, you know, who found the enzyme defect. And the enzyme defect is obviously an enzyme that is a UDP acetyl glucosamine uh, glucnac 1 phosphotransferase. It's an enzyme that transfers to one of the manoses on the carbohydrate chain in lysosomal enzymes. Um, a special uh, located mannose, you will see that in a moment, and that phosphor marker is still protected by a, 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 a glucosamine here. There is a second, and so the enzyme defect is the first one of these two because that molecule is removed by an esterase, a diesterase, you know, it's also called an acetyl glucosaminidase, it goes away and you have the 6-phosphate, nano-6-phosphate marker. Next slide. Well, we, when we start building uh, carbohydrate side chains to the enzyme, the lysosomal enzymes, we have a lot of transferase making an enormous long chain which is do or try untenable and all of these are all these round numbered here are all manoses so there is a lot of manos transferase in fact next slide and when you have seen there are three glucoses at the end these glucoses are removed because there is a, 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 a there are, there are a, a helper proteins that make sure that only the properly uh, glucosinated uh, side chains are going to the Ergic first and to the Colby. And the enzyme we are talking about as being responsible for putting the, uh, the, the mono 6 phosphate marker on is UDP glucnac 1 phosphotransferase. And you see here this uh, UDP, this glucnac here and it is removed by a second enzyme in a certain stage of an oligomanosyl type side chain. I have called this pathway A because pathway B, starting from this molecule, makes, uh, makes a few of the enzymes to, of the complex type where you have additional N-acetyl glucosamine, galactose and salic acid and these enzymes are destined to go in normal people also outside or in the membrane, the cell membranes as well. The, this marker binds to the, the, the receptor and I will not say anything about the receptor. It would, be, it would bring me too far and first of all my contribution to that work has been absolutely zero. But you need that, that monose 6-phosphate here, you know, in order to bind it to a receptor that has actually the function of binding many other molecules as well. Next. <clears throat> so what we also did, because we are the only ones who had autopsies on patients, we did, uh, we wanted to know, since only uh, in connective tissue do we find these lysosomal abnormalities and in the plasma, how about the enzyme defect? Now we found the enzyme defect to be present in all tissues, in absolutely all tissues. Next. We come now to ML3. And ML3 is the so-called, well, we have uh, contributed to delineating ML2 in our science paper in 1967. Marotou and Lamy had already published a clinical different delineation of a disorder they call pseudo-hormonal polydystrophy. 
I've never understood what the reason for that name is because ML3 patients and her do not resemble one bit, you know, it's only. Anyway, what I am very proud and grateful to say is that the eye cell type fibroblast, cyto cytological hallmark in eye cell disease, were also detected in fibroblast cultures of ML3 patients. And that was done by a guy who is present here. <laughs> oh, you know, because I didn't know the man, but I was very impressed. I said, gee, that's fantastic, you know, these, the, and there was also a clinical paper that I recommend reading to anybody, even Marcusi is involved. So all of a sudden, I was not only of some importance in, in, in Madison, but, but I turned out to be important also in, in I couldn't do anything wrong for my music anymore since that. <laughs> anyway, how that's your contribution, and I keep on, uh, I'm happy to remind you that we are so grateful that you are here. Um, so, we found biochemically, and all of us found that too, all the biochemical abnormalities we have found in ML3 a little less pronounced than in ML2. So, it looked like this. Uh, phosphotransferase is a very important thing. And the ML3 patients look a little better, have a, a slower onset and can live al alone. And also they are mentally, uh, most of them are pretty normal, you know. Uh, we, uh, uh, we thought that this enzyme would be important and that obviously the mutation should be found as well. Next slide. Uh, so the, with the current name to mucolipidosis 3 is alpha, beta, and mucolipidosis 3 gamma. Uh, Sarah Kati and a bunch of famous authors have that terminology, and it looks like it is uh, accepted by everybody. Next. <coughs> Talking about ML3 and the clinical part of it, I had the good fortune of meeting a non-identical twin pair, one affected with ML3 and a normal sister. She is a heterozygote even, that I know, because the mutations of these people have been found here. Um, this young lady, you know, had flat coarsening phase, gradually less uh, fast than in ML2. A limited motion in the shoulder joints, especially the shoulder joints are the joints we have that are mostly composed of soft connective tissue, not about the bones, and that's why they are so affected. I come to that soft connective tissue at the end. You know, the OFC, the head circumference, also proportional to stature, growth rate soon below normal. So you see already up there Holy Communion, I forgot what age that was, that the affected girl was clearly much smaller than her sister. And we have even the growth curve here, we measured her. She came from the seacoast of Belgium to us to see us regularly. She drove a car which was specially organized and she could drive because she died a cardiac death. Her myocard being replaced almost completely by fibrous, fibrous tissue. And she died in our hospital at age 24 years of age. Next. That is when she was 11 and a half. You see that she is. If, when you look at ML3 patients, please have a picture taken from the side. Because when you see, we will, we will show you pictures over when you see them in front, it looks pretty good. But you see here uh, how much difficulty they have. Next slide. Well, Dr. Cathy and myself have, uh, have had several discussion sessions on what now the definition, clinical definition from ML2 would be after we had encountered, encountered many patients here in 2006 and in 2009 and once more in uh, Charleston in 2012, I believe, and some of them even again in 2015 in St. Louis. And we have been, you know, this was a, a, a question of discussion and giving and taking, and here are the differences. And then we were obviously interested in what, how about the separation? We, we found that this, the whole pattern of clinical variation was uh, discontinuous. It may turn out to be continuous, but the in-between cases are by far the most interesting ones. 
and I will go into that in a moment. Next slide. So it looks like when you are <coughs> having less than 1% of the UPD glutenac 1 phosphotransferase, you are a patient with MO2. When you have up to 10% of normal, you end up being a patient with MO3, the, the, the slowly evolving uh, and so-called milder disease. Next slide, what I do have to say about um, the, the skeletal dysplasia, the, the dysostosis nutriflux in ML3 is much milder, and the, uh, but however, at the, once the, 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 these kids are approaching puberty and adolescence, or even late in childhood, they start having very painful and hips that uh, they all end up no longer walking and in wheelchair. And I think we have over the years been a little bit too conservative in, in presenting them to the orthopedic surgeons. We know of reasonable good results afterwards to give them artificial hips. So we aren't yet totally in the clear about it, but it looks like they can sustain these operations well and have much less pain. Another thing, the pamidronate treatment, uh, the, the phosphonate tre treatment is much more relevant in ML3 because before it is really needed in ML2, the patients are no longer with us. You know, it's ML3, but you don't need some. And they do have, especially these treatments have a, have a, a pain, so they, they help with the, the most sharp uh, complications. Of <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> this is Again, if you compare this spine, that's it, an ML3 spine, the foreshortening of the vertebrae in ML2 is much more pronounced. You see, however, the same picture with these narrow bodies of the corpus, uh, il the iliac corpus. Again, the, the, this is a, a, a you know, halfway dislocated or totally on the other side dislocated hip. Next. Well, the, what I was not at all involved in, but very much impressed by, is the work by the group of Canfield in Oklahoma, who did isolate in bovine tissue, where they had masses of, uh, of tissue to work from, and they isolated the enzyme, which the, the glutenac phosphotransferase, uh, that is uh, here the most primitive uh, presentation of that enzyme. There are different models now, uh, but none is really representing the truth, the, the truth, the physical truth. Again, it is a 540 Dalton complex disulfide linked of homodimers, two alpha, two beta, and two gamma chains. It turned out that, uh, and uh, that was all, all, however done, in the old days, the group in, uh, in where is the, in near Canada, where, uh, where the, 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 the falls, the, 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 yeah, the, the city close to, close to that is, uh, yeah, that is, well, they, these people had done a lot of complementation studies, and they found, not knowing about gamma or alpha beta, they found that most, um, that most uh, that complementation was not found within the biggest group of ML3 patients with ML2 patients results, no complementation, and yet some were complementing. So they, were, they found that there would at least be two groups, genetically speaking, of ML3. And they really predicted the fact that gamma is an older gene, you know. Um, it, it's, I have to skip these things uh, very fast. Next slide. Here is exactly what I mean. They had, initially there was one outlier for all kings, and nobody knows what, uh, you know, no clinical information of that. But there was a group A and a group C, which now A is alpha beta, and C is gamma, obviously. Next slide. And here we have learned through molecular work, you know, that the GNPTAB are, is a gene that encodes the alpha-beta polypeptide, has 21 exons, and is located on chromosome 12Q23. 
the other and the other gene involved provides the gamma, uh, the gamma protein, a smaller protein uh, that apparently has some uh, some uh, function in recognizing the enzymes to uh, before they bind to that uh, to that phosphotransferase. Um, and that gene is located on chromosome 16, has only 11 exons, and is obviously the disorder that uh, uh, when, when mutations are, you know, parallel mutations cause ML3 gamma. Next slide. I, uh, here I will skip this slide because it really tells exactly what I uh, already told. Next. Well, here in, the, in Greenwood, a lot of patients came, as I said, once, uh, the first time a little bit in 2006, 2009 also. And most of the patients you see here with their parents, and even Dr. Kate is, is visible, she's played an enormous important role here in contacting these guys and talking to them and helping with the diagnosis and so on. Most of these patients are true ML3s. The ML2s were lacking, do you know why? Because they didn't exist anymore. They had, you know, passed on. And from the, the studies we know, all the mutations of all of these people, I have the list here with me. These are the results of what uh, has happened in those days in Mike Fries' lab that has been enormously important in uh, clearing these things up. Next. What we, we did a lot of clinical work, and because of that work, we could come up with some own observations regarding the separation of ML2 and ML3 clinically. Next, we had the mutations and, uh, and, uh, of the alpha beta gene, and uh, you know, th that is a, a slide provided by the group of under Mike Vries. Next. <coughs> What we found out, however, is when you compared the clinical phenotype, and we had our patients, there were 62 of them, uh, divided into a core group and in a non-core group. The core group being the group of patients we knew ourselves very, very well. We had seen these patients several times, and we didn't rely on anybody else to really define the phenotype. The non-core group were people who send us samples with some information that was good, not sometimes totally uh, good, but again, less defined. So, but even if you compare here, the difference, if you have a homozygote for nonsense mutations, and for instance, a homozygote for frame shift mutations, like these patients all, you all end up in the ML2 group. When you have on splice site mutations and missense mutations, you end up finally in the ML3 group. We could make certain that the majority of our patients were following and were following that character. It looked as though wherever the mutations were, that a severe mutation would prevent the patient from having ML2. But with a severe mutation in addition to a mild mutation, you would end up with ML3. You know, and that is still the case, although, let me talk about the outliers as well. Next. So, the, intro, the intermediates, we had several eight patients that were not really... Uh, uh, I remember one day we, we went with a, a young patient and both of us, Sarah and myself, we had already an idea. We said, let's have uh, Dr. Dr. Um, uh, Stevenson decide about this patient. And we gave all the information on this patient. He came up with the diagnosis that it was a, an early uh, ML3 patient. And we, ha we couldn't agree more. So he was not, he was, he was not an intermediate. Next slide. <coughs> so the, these are two homozygotes. And what I know, so this, lady, this young lady is, uh, I can't mention her name in, in this circle, she is uh, uh, Kimmet. And we have since a few weeks already evident this was an outlier. Do you know why? We know that the intellectual disability is mild or barely existing in ML3 patients. IQs of 90, 100, 85, 105, or whatever. This young lady had an IQ of 50. 
She was the product of consanguineous parents, uh, first cousins, and we have no evidence that she has an enormous block of genes, homozygous, also around the GMTP AB gene, where obviously also some uh, negative influence towards the brain. Well, that we, we have not yet, but uh, this kid is also an. Uh, an uh, um, he is mentally not an outlier, but I would be very interested to know what we find about him. He is also a homozygote. So we have difficulty with the homozygotes in placing them in the one or in the other group. Results but, will be ready tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still a working day, right? <laughs> Next slide. But here, in the 62 group of patients, I was here in this institution finding out when I looked at the patient uh, that these guys who had always um, um, had each time a common mutation in exon 1, K4Q in the protein, you know, a lysine that was changed into a glutamine, and they had another phenotype. To me, they were outliers, all three of them. One had at that time already deceased. There was, however, one sample coming from under, down under in the world, sent by Silence, uh, and we thought, well, I am very, uh, I'm able to predict that phenotype. And indeed, it turned not only to be a single, uh, it was the youngest of five patients who had all that special, uh, we'll, we'll see a picture in a moment. What is interesting that we got a cell strain from the, the Cell Repository Coriel Institute, that is a homozygote for that mutation. And we, unfortunately, they do not have any information except telling us that it is an ML3. And I think this would be the mildest possible patient. I would love to really know that. And we do not know. This patient should probably still be alive. You know. Next slide. Well, here, let me tell you that in, in this slide shows that physically, the K4Q cases all are similar, close to ML2. However, in respect to longevity and intellectual disability, they really resemble ML3. For instance, next slide. This is one of these patients. Look, he looks pretty much eye cellish, you know. Next slide, he is a little tall. And these are the five affected in that family. And that was the, the youngest kid here. Um, they were here a few years ago, in 1915, they both, these two were both uh, still uh, in, in St. Louis in 2015. She is now in her 30s. These three has died. She died of a kidney disorder complication. I don't know what the uh, relation with the uh, with, uh, K42 is. The boy and these other, the older girl died as well. Next. <coughs> So, uh, but when we look at the, at the uh, lysosomal enzymes in these K4Q cases, they really resemble, they are uh, somehow in between ML2 and ML3, but statistically you couldn't really uh, select them from that. Next. Let me, however, tell you that with the urine samples we collected in 2015, in, uh, no, in 2012 in uh, uh, Charleston, that we know with the new, new methodology in Tim's, developed in Tim's lab, that we certainly see very interesting patterns of differences in the urines of these patients, and the K4Qs and the ML3s and the ML2s are pretty well discernible, which is uh, an, an interesting uh, advancement. We do not want these urine tests results to be the, of any diagnostic value, however, if we ever find a cure, we will eventually be able to use those if to see whether the cure indeed is effective. Because in the urine you have the end result of the poor metabolism of these, these metabolites. That's why I find... Now this is... I forgot to tell you how difficult an assay it is to measure in, uh, in the lab the glucnac phosphotransferase. We did that and we see here that uh, these patients, all with uh, K4Q, have 
a pretty uh, good uh, control activity. Um, the ML3 is also very similar here. That, uh, that homozygote here has almost 20% of the enzyme. You know, of the of the the the, the, the transferase, um, and obviously an ML2 has much less, two percent. I don't know where you uh, how much activity you have to have before you can avoid ML2 instead of ML and having ML3 instead. Next. So I told. I believe everything that is on this slide is readable for somebody who is interested in the next slide. Obviously, K4Q is interesting in a, a few more. It looks like that since we are pretty sure that the neurons are not the first victims, but that the, uh, the, um, the, the cells of, of, of um, I forgot the word now, uh, are surrounding it, are, in, are, are very important there. We have in K4Q for the first time a dissociation between the central nervous system and the skeleton. And therefore it looks like the influence of some mutations, maybe of all of them, is different in differentiated tissues. So uh, it, it really means more than the advantage of we, when we detect that mutation, we can tell the parents, okay, it's going to be a little milder and so on, you know, we, we, know, we can use it for diagnosis, we can use it for prognosis in a way, but I think they mean a lot more for pu future interest in how we have to handle the, you know, the, the, the pathogenesis and how to understand the pathogenesis of the condition. Next slide. What is the spectrum of clinical variants? I'm going to go very close to the issues in mucoribinose. Next slide. Well, first of all, most of these patients have ML2 and ML3. A minority is in between. I mentioned you two groups. The K4Q type is a variant. And nobody less than Stuart Kornfeld has found that these mutations are indeed different because the, K4, the, the alpha beta protein cannot easily link up to the walls of the uh, of the, the, the ELER. And therefore the gamma, uh, the gamma protein cannot easily be recruited because the, the protein is linked. The K the this lysine is very close to a double leucine in the very amino terminal of that protein and therefore the very effect, uh, affecting badly the binding cap capability. So that is, uh, so it means that we can see clinically these differences in limitations. That is something that fascinates me and helps me more and more convinced that if you look carefully at the patients that you really don't still get more out of it. Next slide. And I know, yeah. Are there, I can skip these also fast. Are there other uh, genes that eventually could have an ML2 uh, uh, phenotype? Outside GMTPAB, sure, next slide, we know about the gamma patients. They are not only in the Middle East, but milder ML3 case, uh, uh, cases most of the time. But we have no, we participate in a, in a publication that is originating in <coughs> India, and there they see uh, quite a few, almost exclusively, gamma uh, patients instead of alpha beta genes. The, I do not know of any patient who could be due to the fact of a mutation in the second enzyme that removes the plutnac from the phosphorus. There is none now. And I do not know, there is some talk that somebody has presented a case of a site one protein because the alpha beta protein has to be split into a large alpha and a small uh, beta protein. Uh, two copies of which compose the complex alpha beta to which the gamma is recruited in the ER and stays bound to the wall also in the Golgi apparatus. But we do 
the, 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 the site one protease gene is a very has a very heterogeneous set of functions more than just splitting that enzyme. But we do not know when a mutation is that. What we will see, I am not uh, able to. So very few, if any, patients are really uh, found with ML two or three alpha methyl gamma be outside the, the genes we discussed next. I will skip Pacman dysplasia by telling that this is the prenatal form of ML2. Uh, the reason being that, that it looks like in severe mutations the maternal organism is no longer able to compensate for the lack, the fetal lack of that enzyme activity, certainly not in the third trimester of, uh, of, the, of fetal life. Especially the trimester where an enormous growth is still taking place before the end of the pregnancy. Next. So, go ahead, I have to skip this because prenatal manifestations, we have your periosteal cloaking, all the things I, and the pre. Uh, uh, dysostosis multiplex bone disease is relevant prenatally also in all ML2 cases. And next slide, I have probably, you'll see, this, this is. True stuff that, especially what they do not understand, all the ML2 cases studied from that respect have a temporary transient uh, hyperactivity of the para, uh, parathyroids. They have a skeletal dysplasia type that look uh, quite a bit like uh, uh, rickets, and obviously they have these special bone changes which you do not see in ML3. Next. Yeah, here this, this slide has go. My issue is now, and this slide, I don't know, my texts are completely mixed up here. What I do want to say is we know quite a bit about the bones. We know reasonably well about the genome. What we know very little, if anything, about is the soft connective tissue. And the soft connective tissue is affected from birth in ML2. It's very much affected in ML3 as well. And it is mostly the dead, the cause of that we lose these patients, because also the cardiac valves are of soft connective tissue. And we know very little, and nobody has ever studied that. I also am interested in the cartilage, because it looks like the cartilage cell is the most affected, differentiated cell, because it, it just doesn't work anymore beyond the beyond the pregnancy where the mom's organism at least can help out for, for a while. Um, and that's why having in soon here some the zebrafish uh, studies, be, because when the, the human infant is born, a lot of ossification is already going on. You know? So if you have an organism that especially looks at the cartilage, uh, I would like to know whether a mild mutation and a severe mutation have different effects on the cartilage in the zebrafish. That would be a very important point that has never been studied. However, I'm more interested even in the soft connective tissue. Because that would be, if we find the cure of getting that in order, we would probably already gonna do a blood check. Next slide. I think I'm, I'm yeah, see, the, the hands, the bones of the ML3 patients are very much more normal, yet they cramp, and that is because of the soft connective tissue. Next, you see here, you see here, these bones are totally different from what you see in ML3, so you only need a little bit more of that transferase, and your bones are normal, but your connective tissue is not. Next. Here, you see, when you study these patients, you see how the joints are very limited, especially the shoulder joints. Next. And, you know, I put in text, if you want to read the stuff afterwards, you can read that. Next. So, I do think that we have to pay a lot of attention to the, to the first of all, early in the pregnant, early uh, in, uh, in ML2. There must be a lot of sig abnormal signaling going on. What I certainly know is that the, high, the intramembranous ossification in these patients is at one time after birth hyperactive. That's why these, these metacarpals blow up. And 
the in the endochondral ossification is completely dead. Maybe a little bit active that we cannot even see, but when that stops completely, the overactivity of the intramembranous ossification is also ending. Another thing, the craniosynostosis is, you know, the, the people say, well, they fill up their sutures <coughs> of the skull much too early. Yes, that is intramembranous ossification. But it's going to stop very soon, so do stay away from the surgeon's feet. Next, the last slide gives you some interesting, uh, re I think relevant studies on in nature reviews on the TGR signaling in context. Then the fibrosis paper in Nature Medicine in 2015, a, a difficult but interesting patient. And even the New England Medicine, Journal of Medicine in 2015 has provided a large survey article on fibrosis. And not only ML2 patients are the victim of fibrosis, but we know that lungs and other liver and so many other diseases are different. So if we understand fibrosis even in another direction, we may get some ideas on how we eventually would solve the whole thing. That's, I think, the end of my story. And I'm sorry if I'm a little late and did the best I could. Thank you.